Nice to meet you. My name is Min Lee, and um, I'm a senior lecturer in marketing at the University of Winchester in the UK. Um, <clears throat> I'm particularly interested in um, you know, symbolic consumption, so how people actually present who they are to the consumption practices. So I will talk about some part of my research in relation to that um, aspect. So especially I, I will talk about um, CSR practices in the luxury sector, but um, I will see CSR practices in a quite a critical way. Okay, so um, I'd say basically uh, we are living in the ethics era. So um, basically, you know, ethics becomes a very important part in the marketplace. And also, you know, there is a growing popularity of that um, cares about the uh, sort of role of the luxury firms. Okay, so um, as you can see from this slide, um, that's why lots of like luxury firms and actually most of the luxury firms conduct CSR practices as a part of their main businesses. And in here, uh, corporate social responsibilities could be done in various ways. Okay, so uh, this is an example. So uh, Louis Vuitton and Hennessy, they also do a huge uh, business in this area. So they do CSR practices. And basically, um, LVMH focuses on the four pillars. Okay, there are four main values that they focus on. And um, as you could probably remember in the morning session, uh, they focus very much on the, uh, supporting the young people. So that's a part of their uh, CSR practices. And also you can see uh, some other examples as you can see over uh, these four values. But I'd say like LVMH's uh, CSR practices um, are conducted in a quite macro level, or maybe I could say in a large scale uh, base, rather than um, you know actually impact on the consumer decision making processes. So uh, these are the specific examples that you can find uh, from their website. So um, LVMH considers like um, ethics um, in terms of their environmental issues, or um, you know they do uh, some businesses um, in relation to the uh, recycling schemes, etc. Um, and there is one competitor, okay, which is the Karen Group. They do more uh, visible or maybe practical uh, CSR practices, which could directly impact on the consumer's uh, decision-making processes. So one example might be they produce um, a lot of products uh, which are based on the uh, sustainable sources. Okay, that would be a one example. So as you can see from this slide, um, you know, some of the brands on that group um, you know, develop the products which are made uh, with the biosynthetic materials like the handbags and the shoes. So maybe I would say uh, the people who consider ethics very important, and they will choose that particular product because of that particular value. So, uh, lots of like luxury major firms, uh, they do CSR practices uh, very actively. However, um, we need to think about uh, those practices in a quite a critical manner. Okay, so I'd say a CSR is normally considered as a positive action, but there are lots of research coming out in these days, and um, they argue that actually, you know, does they make an actual contribution to the society? Okay, so maybe you know you could find uh, some research, uh, some empirical st studies, which demonstrate uh, that. Actually, some consumers find uh, luxury firms' CSR activities in a negative way, or uh, maybe you know some, some people argue that uh, some of the CSR practices um, are um, considered as a tool of corporate PR rather than actually making an actual contribution. So, um, you know, my research started from this particular idea. So, even though CSR practices are heavily done. Um, but uh, we need to think about what would be the authentic CSR uh, that the luxury firms could actually do. So uh, the current CSR practices could be explained uh, based on the Carroll's uh, CSR framework. So I'd say uh, most of the CSR practices actually belong to the third stage in here, like ethical stage. So Carroll said uh, most of the companies actually achieve uh, their economic responsibility, which is the basic uh, stage. And then they go to the second and third and fourth stage in here. So um, I say uh, most of the companies do have some ethical practices rather than being unethical. So they belong to the third stage, but um, there are some companies 
uh, who do some mediocre LCSR prophecies, um, so that maybe they just follow the ethical bandwagon. So uh, maybe then uh, we need to think about what would be the philanthropic level, which is the final stage, or maybe that would be the desirable stage of CSR. And I'd say that could be the authentic CSR that the luxury firms could ultimately achieve. So um, based, you know, um, ethics and CSR, this is such a complex area, so I'm not going to just find the one definite answer in here, but I just want to explore uh, this particular concept um, in here. So, um, so my research aim is to investigate uh, the nature of authentic CSR in the luxury business sector. So I'm particularly interested in what do we mean by authentic and inauthentic CSR, and how the luxury firms can actually achieve uh, that authentic CSR practices. So, um, I've done this one, I, I wanted to investigate uh, that research aim, so I try to explore uh, the self-defined actively conscious consumers perspective toward ethics. So, how they understand and define ethics, and also how they reflect uh, those ethics in their consumption behaviours. So, lots of previous uh, luxury consumption studies actually focus on the luxury consumers, so-called luxury consumers, who belong to the top of the pyramid, like the social outlets, or literally just financially rich. Um, but actually, you know, um, my study focuses very much on the athlete conscious consumers' views, because uh, they are very proactive, and also they consider ethics as a key decision-making factor when they purchase something. So they do purchase luxury products, but they consider ethics as a key priority. So I try to understand their views um, in terms of the notion of ethics um, in here. And in this study, um, I, I will talk about CSR in relation to the consumption context. So um, in order to um, investigate or achieve uh, that uh, research aim, uh, my research, as my research, um, aims to understand and elicit uh, the ethically conscious consumer's understanding. I took uh, an iterative approach, so I've done an ethnographic study as a part of my PhD. So what I've done was I've done the six months of observation. So I chose uh, one ethically conscious consumer group in South Korea. I'm going to explain that one later. So I joined a six month of participant observation okay, of their activities, and also I've conducted 30 uh, semi-structured in-depth interviews um, from, from the VAT consumer group. So uh, basically, you know, um, I found uh, lots of like so-called ethical consumer group in South Korea, but uh, some of the ethical consumer groups um, are actually linked to the uh, conglomerates, so large corporations, they run some um, African consumer groups, uh, but I ignored uh, these kind of groups because they are linked to the profit-oriented uh, communi uh, communities. And also, you know, there are lots of like people who joined uh, that kind of groups because of their CV. Okay, they wanted to talk about uh, their experiences just, uh, um, just uh, in relation to their future careers. So. I chose uh, one consumer group, okay, which is called Abora, and um, this is an independent entity. Okay, so uh, this group does not uh, link with any other political or religious communities, but this is an independent entity, and this group is composed uh, with the self-defined active conscious consumers. So this group uh, was uh, like a subcultural group, so which is composed of like-minded people. So these are the people who just are purely interested in ethics and they just join the group uh, because they want to disseminate uh, particular ethical values to the public. So um, <clears throat> I joined uh, this group's activities for six months and also I chose um, my 20 participants from this, uh, uh, this uh, Kunishima group. So 10 participants uh, was the, the people who joined uh, this group for a long time. Uh, by the way, this group uh, recruits uh, new members every six months. And then I, um, I selected 10 another participants who are relatively new to the group. So I've conducted um, you know, 10 interviews with the uh, original members. And then I've done 10 interviews with the new members. 
And then after the six months, I did the second interview with uh, these new members, you know, to see if they fully understand uh, the notion of ethics in here. So uh, that was my research, um, you know, method um, that I chose. So uh, today I'd like to talk about just one key theme because this is a working uh, paper. So one key theme um, that I found uh, was basically, you know, the participants, um, how they understand ethics was quite interesting. So they believe that ethics in consumption or ethical consumption um, is something that nobody could actually achieve because there is no ethical consumption. But this is something that everyone could do, um, could get in closer to achieve uh, in a certain state. So basically, you know, uh, the, the current CSR studies or ethical cons consumption studies actually define ethical consumption as a mere um, ethical product buying behaviors. But actually, you know, um, what they're saying is people cannot always purchase ethical products. Or maybe, you know, they could just purchase uh, the ethical uh, products just one time. And also, there is no perfect ethical products you could find in the marketplace. So ethically labeled products in the marketplace, they just deal with a very limited areas of CSR ethics, but they do not fully cover um, all ethical dimensions. So what they're interested in is uh, they put particular focuses on the uh, micro practices that you can find uh, in, in daily lives. So uh, rather than purchasing like ethically labeled products or maybe expensive uh, ethically labeled handbags, they focus very much on the small products um, or maybe something that you could continuously purchase in your daily life. And this theme um, was found during the observation. So uh, this was just a brief a schedule that I can show you. So I've done a six month observation and I've joined 36 um, activities that the participants created. So to summarize you know, all these 36 activities, Based, you know, they create, um, you know, some of the ethical consumption activities, or they joined um, some of the external uh, festivals, like the fair trade festivals, and then they try to educate uh, the public that ethical values are embedded in our daily lives. So that means ethical consumption should not be limited to the ethical product buying behaviors. But maybe we know we could think about um, some other ways that, that we could find. And this kind of uh, theme could be supported uh, by the data uh, from the same structured interviews. So I've um, you know, put three quotes here from the three participants in here. And these quotes actually uh, show how the participants uh, define ethical consumption. So, uh, basically, you know, all these three people actually talk about the same stuff in here. So the participant A says, oh, there is no exact boundaries in ethical consumption, but this is something that you could find in your daily lives. So rather than having um, an ethical, like a uh, fair trade coffee, for instance, um, you know, it would be better to focus on the uh, coffee in a cup, okay, rather than having a plastic cup, for instance. Or a participant B says, um, you know, ethical consumption is something that uh, we should do in a continuous manner. So this is not just a one-off, um, you know, product buying behavior. And the participant three said, C says, there is no perfect ethical consumption, but uh, maybe, you know, we could do something ethical compared to the current situation. And interestingly, you know, uh, this theme uh, was in line with the contemporary view towards um, luxury consumption. So traditionally, you know, when we talk about luxury consumption, it is all belong to the Vavlin's corn speakers consumption. So Vavlin says luxury consumption is all about uh, having a wasteful and lavish expenditure. Okay, so by making a distinction by purchasing very expensive products, so luxury consumption is more about uh, showing off your social status. But in these days, you know, in these days, luxury consumption should not be limited to that uh, corn speakers aspects. But maybe, you know, you could think about um, today's uh, the complex dyna and dynamics of our uh, luxury consumption. So today's luxury consumption is largely subjective and also is socially constructed. So that means um, people, today's luxury consumers, present 
um, or reflect particular actors or belief through the consumption processes. And that could be done in a very quiet and subtle way. So maybe you, know, you don't have to purchase like um, logo with a um, organic cotton-based product. But maybe you could choose um, you know, some products uh, which have a subtle um, ethical values. So that links with the emergence of inconspicuous consumption. And I've talked about uh, this particular concept in 2016 at this conference. So this, uh, the current study actually finds um, you know, the correlation or maybe the relationship between ethics and uh, the inconspicuous consumption. So, uh, basically, you know, um, I, I guess you know uh, this study actually um, shows that ethical values are embedded in everyone's daily lives. So that means you know the practitioners actually think about CSR in a quite different way. So rather than just uh, thinking about ethical consumption or ethical products in a separate um, you know category. Maybe you know the luxury business sector should think about implementing CSR to law enforcement product categories, or maybe something uh, that you could purchase in everyday um, you know shopping behaviours. So I'd say um, you know the um, current uh, CSR practices um, actually focus very much on the valuing products like in these days. But maybe you know um, if we just focus on the high volume products like valuing products. Maybe your ethical consumption could be limited to the one-off consumption. But if we could just focus on the habitual um, or maybe mundane consumption aspects, low enforcement product categories, but then probably you know, uh, we could put uh, more people to be involved in the uh, ethical consumption practices. So um, basically, you know, um, I'd say uh, this study as a working paper um, attempts to show a snapshot of ethically conscious consumers' perception toward ethics. And I think the key value of this study is uh, that uh, trying to explore luxury brands' CSR practices uh, in a quite unconventional way. Because my study um, didn't particularly uh, involve in the luxury consumers in here. So, I'd say, um, you know, my, my final message is uh, basically, you know, um, I think um, it is time, this study actually talks about um, the meaning of authentic CSR in here, navigates uh, the notion of authentic CSR by looking at the ethical consumer's perspective. So maybe, you know, from this uh, study, um, you know, my final message is uh, basically, you know, we need to start to think about what would be the authentic role of a luxury business in our society? Okay, what they could do um, actually compared to the current stage. So that's it for, for my study and thanks for your um, time. And any questions, uh, please let me know. Any questions? Do you think that the um, low purchase frequency in luxury makes it makes uh, ethical aspects unattractive in the luxury market compared to fast moving consumer goods where we buy like once a week fair trade uh, coffee beans compared to luxury where we buy once a week uh, once a life a Ferrari or a Rolex? Do you think that there will be a difference in ethical aspects or in the appreciation of ethics between luxury and fast moving consumer goods? Um, in here, my study like does not really talk about like fast moving consumer goods in here. But maybe you know if you talk about like more important product categories, that could be like um, entry level products or maybe like underwears. Okay, so the luxury firms deal with uh, those um, like particular product categories. Obviously, like LVMH uh, does not deal with like coffee. So um, I'm not uh, just talking about the fast moving consumer goods in here, but maybe, you know, rather than just focusing on the handbags or the expensive products, but maybe, you know, they could reflect CSR or maybe ethical values in a more lower level uh, product categories. Thank you. Maybe a second question to that, because uh, I think it's an interesting point, is whether you think that the expectation from consumer is that luxury brands have a higher responsibility mm. to do CSR because of maybe what we see I think um, what I think um, these uh, these particular participants 
Well, they believe on that point. Okay, they believe the electric firms should be more responsible. And also, they, if they do, if they say that they do the CSR, then they need to do the proper audio quantity CSR. But I've seen uh, lots of other studies which actually talk about the different stuff. So lots of like luxury consumers, they put the luxury values or the branded strategies um, as a key priority rather than ethics because these are not the ethical brands. Um, but maybe, you know, it really depends on the consumers. But my study tries to open up some different views that because there are, you know, some luxury consumers, someone like these people actually consider ethics as a key uh, decision-making factor. Any other question? As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm sure you know that it's kind of but when PP options their name to carrying, ah. one of the reasons is to show that they do care. You know, carrying is the common okay. form of caring. Care for the people and the care for society in general. So thank you very much. Okay.